So in the previous class, we started with the axial skeleton. Today, we're continuing with the skeletal system, uh, but focusing now on the appendicular skeletal system. So here are the main components of the appendicular system. So there are two pectoral girdles, two upper limbs, one pelvic girdle, and two lower limbs. So starting with the pectoral girdle, this is what allows us to articulate the upper extremity with the axial skeleton. Uh, it's made of two bones, uh, so a clavicle and a uh, scapula. The clavicle can be felt at the top uh, of the chest. This is the collarbone, and then the scapula is the shoulder blade, uh, which is found behind the ribs. These two uh, form a joint called the acromioclavicular joint or AC joint, um, and then the clavicle will be attaching to the sternum. So looking at just the clavicle, there are two uh, regions or two ends of the clavicle. There's the region that will articulate with the uh, scapula. This is called the acromial end. Uh, as we'll see in a few slides, it's a t articulating with the acromion of the scapula. And then the other end is the sternal end. So the sternal end is articulating with the sternum, in particular, the manubrium of the sternum. So here is just another uh, view of a clavicle. So in general, the sternal end is uh, more like a fist. It's uh, a bit thicker at the end. And then the acromial end is more like a pancake uh, where it will flatten out uh, and reach about the same height as the acromion on the scapula. So here are some features found on the scapula. Uh, so like I just mentioned, we have the acromion up here, and you'll notice that it has about the same height as the acromial end of the clavicle. The acromion is actually a continuation of the spine of the scapula. Uh, so that is a great feature to identify if you're uh, to identify the posterior side of a scapula. Um, there is another uh, bump coming off or another process that looks similar to the acromion but is more anterior. This is called the coracoid process. Um, and then there is a uh, fossa called the, or a cavity called the glenoid cavity. Uh, this is the socket for the ball and socket joint of the shoulder. And then finally on the anterior side, there is a, a smooth depression called the subscapular fossa uh, where uh, the subscapularis muscle will be sitting. And then you can see the ribs um, are in close proximity to the subscapular fossa. <clears throat> So here's a diagram showing uh, anterior and posterior views of the scapula. Uh, so I think the best feature to identify anterior versus posterior is the spine. So that's this big ridge uh, running down the posterior side of the scapula. So much like our spine is in our back, the spine of the scapula is uh, on the posterior side. So on the anterior side, uh, you can see the coracoid process, which is more anterior than the acromion. Uh, the glenoid cavity where the head of the humerus will be uh, forming the ball and socket joint of the shoulder. There are two borders found on the scapula. There is the uh, lateral or axillary border. So axillary um, means armpit. Uh, so this is going to be the lateral side, which makes sense because we have to have our humerus uh, articulating on the lateral side, not the medial side, as you can see in this little diagram down here. So then the medial side uh, will be facing the vertebrae. So this will be our vertebral or medial border. Um, then for a few depressions or fossas uh, on the anterior side, uh, on the previous slide I mentioned, we have this subscapular fossa. On the posterior side, uh, there are two fossas. Uh, there is one that is above the spine, uh, which is the supraspinous fossa. And there is one that is below the spine called the infraspinous fossa. So supra meaning above, infra meaning below. Here we have the components of the pectoral girdle. We have a clavicle and a scapula. The clavicle has two ends. Uh, here we have the sternal end, which is much thicker. It looks kind of like a fist. Uh, this is what's articulating with the sternum. Meanwhile, the thin region on the other end of the clavicle will articulate with the acromion and is called the acromial end.
So here we have a scapula. You're looking at the anterior side. The anterior side has this smooth subscapular fossa. Meanwhile, the posterior side has this long ridge called the spine. Above that ridge is the supraspinous fossa, and below the ridge is the infraspinous fossa. The two borders of the scapula are called either the uh, lateral border or the medial border. The lateral border is also called the uh, axillary border. The medial border is called uh, the vertebral border as well. On the lateral side, there is a space uh, for the head of the humerus to articulate. So this is called the glenoid cavity. Um, and this is forming a portion of our ball and socket joint at the shoulder. So after the pectoral girdle, uh, we now encounter the upper limb. So the upper limb consists of the arm, the forearm, uh, and the hand, which consists of the carpal bones, the metacarpals, and the phalanges. So when we talk about uh, the arm, we don't mean that the whole upper extremity is the arm. Instead, we use the arm just to distinguish uh, where the humerus is. Uh, the forearm is where the radius and the ulna are found, and then the hand is where the carpal, metacarpals, and phalanges are found. So here we're looking at a humerus. I'm going to move myself out of the way to better uh, explain this. So on the humerus, we have an anterior side and a posterior side. Uh, we have a medial and a lateral side. So it's usually very useful to identify uh, if you're looking at the front or back and uh, the medial or lateral side. So here we have it labeled anterior. Here we have posterior. Um, and I know the head of the humerus has to be medial because this is what's forming a joint with the glenoid cavity. Um, so the head is going to be the smooth surface that forms the uh, shoulder joint. Immediately following the head, we have uh, two bumps coming off of it. Off the humerus, we have a lesser tubercle and a greater tubercle. So these are bumps coming off that allow for muscles to attach to the humerus. You can see both the greater and lesser on the anterior side. Meanwhile, the posterior side, you can just see the greater tubercle. Another feature used for muscle attachment is this structure called the deltoid tuberosity. Uh, so this is a portion of rough bone that allows the deltoid to attach to the humerus. And then as we reach uh, the inferior region of the humerus, we encounter uh, epicondyles. Uh, so epicondyles mean uh, we're above a condyle. Uh, so we'll talk about the condyles that make up a portion of the elbow joint in a few slides. But uh, looking at the lateral and medial epicondyle, the medial epicondyle is significantly larger. So this is what can actually be felt if you extend your arm with the palm facing forward and rub the inside of your elbow. You can feel the big bump coming off of it. So that would be the medial epicondyle, and then the lateral epicondyle is a bit smaller um, and on the lateral side. So these two allow for uh, muscles to attach. Uh, so again, on the posterior side, you can see both medial and uh, lateral epicondyle. And then I'll talk about these two fossas in just a second. Okay, so I mentioned that the tubercles were right after the head. Uh, there's actually a structure in between the head and the tubercles. This is called the anatomical neck. So that is going to be really uh, defining the boundary of the head from the rest of the uh, humerus. Uh, so for the humerus, there are actually two necks. There is the anatomical head and the, uh, I'm sorry, the anatomical neck and the surgical neck. So the anatomical neck is much thicker compared to the surgical neck, which is going to be found after the greater and lesser tubercle. Okay, so now uh, looking at how uh, we have condyles at the end of the humerus that allow the radius and ulna to attach. Uh, so in this case, these condyles have fancy names. So we have two condyles. One is called the capitulum. One is called the trochlea. So the capitulum is what the... Uh, head of the radius will be attaching to. The trochlea is what the ulna will be wrapping around. So these allow for the hinge movement at the elbow. On the anterior side, uh, there is a depression at the bottom of the bone, at the bottom of the humerus called the coronoid fossa. Um, so this is where the coronoid process of the ulna will be inserting whenever the elbow is flexed. 
Meanwhile, on the posterior side, um, we now see that the capitulum has disappeared. So we're looking again at the inferior portion of the humerus. Uh, when I flip back to the anterior side, you can see the capitulum at the bottom. Uh, but from the posterior side, we can only see the trochlea. And instead of the core onoid fossa, uh, we have another fossa on the posterior side, uh, but this one is called the olecranon fossa, which will allow the olecranon process of the ulna uh, to um, insert into this fossa whenever the elbow is extended. So testing your knowledge, list three specific features that you could use to side a humerus. Explain how you would use each one of these um, and try to give a function for each one of these. So maybe pause the video and write a few um, features down. Okay, so a few features you can use to side a humerus. Um, one would be the head of the humerus. So the head should tell you that you're looking at the medial view. Another feature would be uh, seeing both tubercles, both lesser and greater tubercle. So those are these bumps found up here. So when I can see both the lesser and the greater, I'm looking at an anterior side. And when I can only see the greater, I'm looking at a posterior side. Another structure uh, would be the medial epicondyle. Uh, so this is the big bump uh, on the medial side of our uh, elbow. Another structure would be the capitulum. So the capitulum is only visible on the anterior side and it is not visible on the posterior side. Okay, on to the radius and the ulna. So these are the bones that make up the forearm. So uh, the radius and the ulna are pretty similar in diameter. Uh, the ulna actually has a U at the top of it, which makes it easy to remember, and the head of the radius is more or less a circle. So these should be easy to distinguish when you can see these two features. Um, both radius and ulna will be articulating with carpal bones. Uh, they both have styloid processes, these little tips or projections coming out of them at their inferior region. And then the ulna has additional structures at the top of it. So it has this trochlear notch that will wrap around the trochlea on the humerus. And then it has the coronoid process. Uh, this is the process that will be going into the coronoid fossa whenever the elbow is flexed. And then there is the olecranon process, which will go into the olecranon fossa whenever the elbow is extended. So here is an example of the elbow joint. You can see the head of the radius pairing with the capitulum and the trochlear notch of the ulna wrapped around the trochlea. Finally, we have carpal bones uh, at the hand. So you don't have to know the individual names of the carpal bones. Just know that these are uh, technically our wrist um, so this is where the radius and the ulna will be attaching. Get myself back up here. So after the carpal bones, uh, we're going to have metacarpal bones. So a lot of people think that these are actual fingers. So the metacarpals are actually found in the palm of the hand. We just have a lot of muscle tissue here uh, to make it look like that's just a solid structure. But instead, if you really feel, especially on the back of your hand, uh, you'll feel individual long bones. So those are metacarpals. The naming system is very simple. So starting where the thumb is, you have metacarpal 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Um, for the fingers, uh, so we're using the same naming system where the thumb is number 1. Um, but now we have um, two phalanxes or phalanges on the thumb and three on uh, the remaining fingers. So on the thumb, you either have proximal phalanx number one or distal phalanx number one. And then for the remaining four fingers, you have a proximal, middle, and distal phalanx. Here we have a humerus. So the humerus is what will be articulating with our scapula. So the humerus will articulate with the scapula at the glenoid cavity to form the shoulder. Directly below the head of the uh, humerus, we have the anatomical neck, and then we have the surgical neck. 
Uh, to identify if we're seeing an anterior view, you can identify these two bumps. Here we have the lesser tubercle. Here we have the greater tubercle. So here you're looking at it from an anterior view. Uh, lesser tubercle is facing towards the screen. Greater tubercle is pointing to the side. From a posterior view, you can only see the greater tubercle. As we go down uh, the humerus, we reach a ridge uh, right about halfway. This is called the deltoid tuberosity, allowing the deltoid muscle to attach. And then at the inferior region, we have structures for uh, the radius and ulna to attach to the humerus. So here we have this rounded structure called the capitulum. This is where the head of the radius will attach. And here we have the trochlea, which is uh, what is used to connect to the ulna. There are two epicondyles. There's the medial epicondyle, which is the larger uh, epicondyle found on the medial side, and then the lateral epicondyle found on the uh, lateral side. And then there are two fossas that are used to articulate with the ulna. The anterior fossa is called the coronoid fossa, not to be confused with the coracoid process. Uh, on the scapula. Here we have the coronoid fossa that will articulate with the coronoid uh, process on the ulna. On the posterior view, we do not see the capitulum anymore. So here is our capitulum. When I turn it around, you cannot see the capitulum, but you can see the trochlea. And then a fossa on the posterior side, which is called the olecranon fossa. This will be used to um, allow the olecranon process to go into the humerus whenever the arm or the elbow is extended. So then we have the next two bones, the radius and ulna. So it's very easy to identify which bone is which because the ulna, the word starts with a U and there's literally a U at the top of the ulna. Likewise with the radius, when you think radius, you think radius of a circle the head of the radius is almost a perfect circle. So these bones should be very easy to distinguish. So the radius will always be on the side uh, where the thumb is. Uh, so if you make thumbs up, it kind of looks like you're making a lowercase r. Uh, so the radius will always be on the side where the thumb is. So looking at structures here, uh, we have the head of the radius, uh, and then we have the styloid process of the radius, which is going to be the very tip at the end of the radius. Uh, likewise, on the ulna, we have a styloid process at the end of the ulna. But at the top of the ulna, there are a few additional structures. So this little uh, process right here will be the coronoid process. This is what will be going into the coronoid fossa on the humerus. We have the trochlear notch, which will be wrapping around the trochlea. And then we have the olecranon process, which will go into the olecranon fossa on the humerus. And then the final two bones, uh, or the final set of bones that these two bones will articulate with uh, are found on the hand. So here we have a hand where we have carpal bones, then we have metacarpal bones. So the metacarpal bones are again found where the palm is. Uh, metacarpal bones, and then finally the phalanges. So starting with the thumb, we have uh, phalange number one, two, three, four, and five. On the thumb, we just have a proximal and distal phalanx. So this would be proximal phalanx number one, distal phalanx number one. The remaining four fingers have a proximal, middle, and distal phalanx. Okay, so at this point, uh, I would encourage you to pause the video, read these questions, and try to answer each question. In a few seconds, I will cover uh, the answers. Okay, so number one, a person that broke the most distal portion of the ring finger just under their fingernail fractured what bone? Be specific. So they fractured proc or distal phalanx number four. Number two, the styloid process of the radius is closest to which finger? So the radius will be on the side of the hand where the thumb is. So the styloid process of the radius is closest to the thumb. Number three, the head of the radius articulates with the blank of the humerus. So this would be the capitulum of the humerus. And number four, 
the blink of the scapula and the blink of the humerus form the shoulder joint. So the glenoid cavity of the scapula and the head of the humerus form the shoulder joint. Okay, so now we're ready to look at the uh, inferior portion of the appendicular skeletal system. So we'll first start with uh, the components that make up the uh, pelvic girdle. So we have here uh, a single bone uh, that's actually made of a few bones that have fused together. So this is called an oscox. Uh, this is one of two hip bones. Uh, a single oscox uh, is going to be made of three um, bones that have fused together. So we have the ilium uh, in yellow here, the pubis in pink, and the ischium in green. So here uh, we have a single oscox. Uh, over here we have a full pelvis. So you'll notice that the pelvis is going to be the two oscox plus the sacrum and the coccyx, which are part of the axial skeleton. So if we look at features just on the ilium, uh, those uh, features are listed over here. So on the anterior side, uh, there is a smooth depression called the iliac fossa. The top ridge uh, on the ilium is called the iliac crest, and this crest eventually comes to an endpoint, uh, which is called the anterior superior iliac spine. And then on the inside, or more medial, is a structure called the greater sciatic notch. So this is a um, indentation that allows the sciatic nerve to uh, pass down and uh, innervate the leg. Okay, looking at the ischium, uh, so the ischium is on the inferior portion of the oscoxa. There's this little uh, protru uh, protruding region called the ischial spine that allows muscles to attach to the ischium. And then there's also this rough uh, raised uh, region at the most inferior uh, portion of the ischium called the ischial tuberosity. So if you've ever had a uh, kid jump into your lap and you feel uh, that they have a very bony butt, you're feeling the uh, ischial tuberosity. And then finally, uh, the pubic. So the pubic uh, bone will be the most anterior bone. So those two bones, uh, the two pubic bones come to meet one another at this joint uh, where the pubic symphysis is. Uh, so this is uh, a piece of cartilage uh, connecting the two pubic bones to one another. Uh, so if we look at shared features uh, of these um, bones, you'll notice that the, all three bones contribute to this structure right here. This is called the acetabulum. So the acetabulum is very similar to the glenoid cavity. So this is the socket for the ball and socket joint of the hip. So the head of the femur will be inserting here into the acetabulum. And then there is this other structure that is made of the uh, ischium and pubic bones. Uh, this is called the obturator foramen. Uh, so this is where um, our obturator nerve will be passing through. So if we look at uh, male versus female uh, pelvises, uh, one notable difference is the pel pelvic inlet. So the male pelvic inlet is more heart-shaped, uh, while the female pelvic inlet is more oval-shaped. Uh, so this is allowing um, a wider diameter to allow um, a fetus to pass through uh, during birth. Um, likewise, the true and false pelvises are a little bit different in size. So the true pelvis is from uh, edge to edge. Um, and then the false pelvis is from each the edge of each iliac crest to one another. So a female uh, uh, false pelvis will be a bit wider compared to a male false pelvis, and then a male true pelvis will be a bit more narrow compared to a female true pelvis. And then a few more differences. Uh, so I think the easiest way to distinguish male versus female is looking at this angle. So this is called the subpubic angle. Uh, so for males, this angle is less than 90 degrees. Meanwhile, for females, the angle is greater than 90 degrees. Um, females will also have the sacrum tilted back, and males will have the sacrum tilted forward. So again, this is opening up the birth canal. And then the sciatic notch will be uh, larger um, for a female compared to a male. Here we have a single os coxa. The two os coxa make up the uh, pelvic girdle, which allow the lower extremity to articulate with the axial skeleton. 
A single Oscoxa has three bones that are fused together. The most superior bone is the ilium, the most inferior bone is the ischium, and most anterior bone is the pubis. The ilium itself has several features. So one of these features would be uh, the iliac crest, which comes to a very uh, fine point called the anterior superior iliac spine. Uh, the ilium also has this smooth surface on the anterior side called the iliac fossa. And then there's this depression down here called the greater sciatic notch uh, through which the sciatic nerve will pass. Uh, the ischium is the inferior bone. It has the ischial spine and the ischial tuberosity, which is this rough uh, area on the bottom. And then our final bone is the pubic bone. So when we have two pubic bones coming together, we have this pubic symphysis on the anterior side. Uh, there are two shared features uh, on an oscoxa. The most obvious is this structure right here called the acetabulum. So this is the socket for the head of the femur to form the hip joint. So the acetabulum has all three bones coming together to contribute to it. And then we have the obturator foramen uh, down here through which the obturator nerve will pass, which is made of uh, the ischium and the pubic bone. So we have uh, both a male and female uh, pelvis uh, present. So they have several differences between the two. Uh, the easiest way to distinguish between the two, I think, is probably to identify uh, the angle, uh, the subpubic angle. So here we have uh, a female pelvis. Here we have a male pelvis. So I know that the tip of a piece of paper is 90 degrees. So if I put this paper in this pelvis, it fits. It's capable of fitting in the subpubic angle. Meanwhile, if I try to fit it into this model over here, the paper cannot fit uh, into the subpubic angle. Another uh, easy way to tell is noticing the sacral tilt. So one of these has a much wider open uh, pelvic inlet or true pelvis, uh, which will allow the uh, baby to pass through the birth canal. Okay, we're now ready to look at the lower limb. Uh, I've removed my video because it's interfering with a lot of the uh, labels on here. So just bear with me as we get through this. Uh, so I want to highlight the similarities of the lower limb with the upper limb. Uh, so in both cases, uh, we have a large bone coming off one of the girdles. So here we have the femur coming off uh, the pelvic girdle. This is very similar to the humerus coming off the pectoral girdle. Next, we have the uh, tibia and fibula, very similar to the uh, radius and ulna. And then finally, we have the foot. Um, and instead of carpal bones, we have tarsal bones. Instead of metacarpals, we have metatarsals. And then in both cases, we have phalanges. If you were to uh, describe the region where the femur is, this would be described as the thigh. The region where the tibia and fibula are would be described as the leg, and then the region um, down at the end would be the foot. So looking at the femur, uh, it starts very similar to the humerus. It has a head, but instead of an anatomical and surgical neck, we just have a uh, basic neck below the head. Um, instead of uh, tubercles now, we have structures called trochanters. They're participating or performing the same function as the tubercles where these allow for muscle attachment. I want to highlight, though, that when you're trying to identify anterior versus posterior, um, there is a difference between the humerus and femur. So in the humerus, you can see both bumps on the anterior side. Here, we're looking at an anterior side on the left. Uh, this is just showing the greater trochanter. Meanwhile, the posterior view shows both the greater and lesser trochanter. So this is a difference between the humerus and femur. Also on the posterior side is a um, ridge called the gluteal tuberosity where um, some of the gluteal muscles will attach. And then we have this long line um, going down the posterior side for muscles to attach, uh, which is called the linea aspera. At the very end of the humerus, uh, we have structures that are very similar to the humerus. Um, I'm sorry, 
uh, this is the femur. At the very end of the femur, you have structures very similar to uh, the end of the humerus. So we have epicondyles. So we have a medial and lateral epicondyle. Uh, and then we have a medial and lateral condyle. So the condyle is where um, we will have bone to bone contact with the tibia. And then the epicondyles are the bumps above the condyles that allow for muscles to attach. Uh, the next bone is the patella. So this is a sesamoid bone, meaning it's going to develop inside a tendon. Uh, and this can be felt uh, as your kneecap. So we do ask that you identify these four ligaments uh, and know them by their full name, not their abbreviation. So here we have um, two really classes of ligaments. We have ligaments that are defined as cruciate ligaments. So these will form a cross. And then we have collateral ligaments, which will form um, a stabilizing structure on either the medial or lateral side of the knee. So the two cruciate ligaments are kind of in the center of the knee and the two collateral ligaments are on the side. So starting with the collateral ligaments, uh, we have the lateral collateral ligament, which is going to be on the lateral side. And then we have the medial collateral ligament, which is going to be on the inside of the knee or the medial side. And then for the two cruciate ligaments, uh, we have our ACL, which is going to be our anterior cruciate ligament. And then we'll have our PCL in the back, uh, the posterior cruciate ligament. So now we're looking from a posterior view. We can see our posterior cruciate ligament and then our anterior cruciate ligament uh, in the front. So these two come together and form a cross. Uh, so this would just be an example of a torn ACL. Uh, so the cruciate ligaments are uh, preventing the knee or the tibia, the tibia or femur from going too far forward or back with respect to the other bone. So in this case, it looks like the tibia likely went too far forward um, and pulled on the anterior cruciate ligament until it finally ripped. The next uh, bones in the uh, lower extremity will be the tibia and fibula. Only one of these bones is going to be weight bearing. Uh, so that bone will be the tibia, which is much thicker compared to the fibula. So the tibia is going to be our medial bone the fibula will be the lateral bone. At the very top of the tibia, there are condyles, a medial and lateral condyle that will articulate with the medial and lateral condyles of the femur. And then there is this little bump uh, that can be felt at the top of your shin called the tibial tuberosity. Uh, this is going to allow for, again, muscles to attach to the tibia. And then the very uh, end of these bones uh, have little projections coming off of them. So instead of uh, styloid processes, which we saw on the radius and ulna, uh, we have uh, malleoli. So we have either a medial malleolus found on the tibia or a lateral malleolus found on the fibula. Um, so if you're squeamish, I would advise you to maybe skip the next slide or the next um, 20 seconds of content. Um, but this is just an interesting case where we can actually see a tibia removed. So there's a basketball player in 2013 playing for U of L uh, named Kevin Ware, uh, who in an elite eight basketball game landed on his leg wrong and actually snapped his tibia. So despite it being such a thick bone, uh, these bones are still susceptible to breaking. So then the final uh, region will be the foot. So we do ask that you identify two uh, tarsal bones. So you didn't have to know the, any of the carpal bones, but we do ask that you identify two of the tarsal bones. Uh, the first one is the talus. So the talus is our top uh, tarsal bone and it's going to articulate with the tibia. So talus on top articulates with tibia. And then the second uh, tarsal bone we ask that you identify is the calcaneus. Uh, this is simply just the heel bone. Uh, the naming system for the metatarsals is identical to the metacarpals. Uh, so the very first one will be metatarsal number one. Then we have metatarsal two, three, four, and five. And same thing with the phalanx uh, naming system. Our big toe would be uh, phalanx number one. So it has a proximal and a distal. So this would be proximal phalanx number one 
distal phalanx number one, and then the remaining four toes have um, three uh, uh, phalanxes, phalanges. So they have a proximal, a middle, and a distal phalanx. Our final set of bones here are the bones that make up the lower extremity. So shown here is a femur. Uh, the femur looks and functions very similar to a humerus. Uh, it forms a ball and socket joint with the uh, with a girdle. Uh, I just want to highlight though uh, how different they are actually in size. So you can see that one is much thicker. The femur is much thicker compared to the humerus because because it is bearing weight. Uh, so despite them having similar structures, they both have smooth heads. Uh, these bones, when compared side by side, look quite different. So focusing just on the femur, uh, at the very top we have the smooth head. This is what will be going into the acetabulum on the os coxa, forming the hip joint. Right below the head is the neck. And then there are two structures that allow for muscle attachment and allow you to identify what side you're looking at. So looking at it from an anterior view like we are now, uh, you can only see the structure called the greater trochanter. When I flip the femur around, you can now see another structure coming off the femur called the lesser trochanter. So from a posterior view, you can see the lesser trochanter and the greater trochanter. From an anterior view, you can only see the greater trochanter. On the posterior side, we have a rough region right here where uh, gluteal muscles will attach. This is called the gluteal tuberosity. And then there is this fine line that runs down all the way on the posterior side called the linea aspera, again for muscle attachment. At the very end of the femur, we have uh, two epicondyles. We have a medial epicondyle. That will be on the side where our head is. So the head will be medial. We have a medial epicondyle here. And then on the other side will be our lateral epicondyle. And then we have a lateral condyle and a medial condyle. These two condyles are what will be articulating with our tibia, the next bone in this uh, up lower extremity. So the tibia will be medial, the fibula will be lateral. So comparing these two in diameter, it's clear which one bears weight. The tibia is much thicker and thus bears weight. Uh, so the tibia has the two condyles at the very top that will articulate with the condyles on the femur. It has this bump on the anterior side called the tibial tuberosity, which will allow for muscles to attach. And then at the very end, we have the medial malleolus. This is the uh, medial ankle bone that you can feel. Uh, the fibula, it doesn't have many distinct structures that we're going to cover, just the lateral malleolus forming the uh, lateral or outside ankle bone that you can feel. Finally, we have a foot. Uh, this foot doesn't look like it's in great condition, uh, but it is a foot nonetheless. So uh, the very top bone right here will be our first tarsal bone. This is called the talus. This is what our tibia will be sitting on. So the talus is on top. It's going to articulate with the tibia. The most posterior tarsal bone is the calcaneus. This is the heel. Uh, for metatarsals, so these would be right here. We have the same naming system as we did for the metacarpals. So we have metatarsal one, two, three, four, and five. And then for the phalanges or the toes, we have a proximal and a distal phalanx number one for the big toe. And then the remaining toes have three phalanx, phalange, phalanges, a proximal, a middle, and a distal 